Coveting? You talk about, you know, oh, hey, yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Hey, what good thing must I do? Hey, I'm doing, what am I lacking? You know, hey, I've been doing what all these things. What can I do? Huh? What, what's what next? What's next? What else? You know? And so Jesus hits to the heart. And he can hit, look, watch what he says here. When Jesus had said this to his disciples, truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. The eye of a needle, by the way, is a small little gate opening in the wall around Jerusalem, okay? And so it was a very small little gate, and most camels could not go through. I mean, they were just too big, okay? Not the little eye of a needle. But still, the point is, even if it was just a little eye of the needle, of an actual of an actual needle. Here's what Jesus was trying to say. Hey, look. It is hard for a rich man to get into heaven. Why? Because, in, and guys, I may be stepping on your toes. I definitely, guys, been stepping on my toes over this. Is hey, look, we live in a wonderful country. I don't know anybody in this room that is poor. I mean, destitute poor. We not be main, main, We may not have all the same pay raises or you know um, yearly salaries and stuff like that. But there's nobody in this room that is desperately poor. We live in a country that provides a lot of wealth. I mean, this is why we have this problem that's going on with, with down in Mexico, and these people are wanting to come. Granted, if I was outside the United States and I wanted to have a better life, I'd be looking for some other way. I mean, that's why you had all the immigrants come over from Europe and other countries, because they saw the, opportunity, the, the opportunity and stuff like that. Hey. But here's what Jesus says. Jesus is not condemning being rich. Jesus has already told us in, in Matthew 6 that you can't serve two masters. You, you love God and, and, you, and you despise money, or you love money and you despise God. Because the problem a lot of times, and truthfully, I, I see this in myself, and I see this in America, is we've become so comfortable with the blessings that God gives to us. And truly, let me make sure I clear that, you clearly understood. What I have, personally, yeah, I may work for it, but it's because God gave me the job. Amen. You know, what I have belongs to God. That's how I look at everything. My car, my house, everything, is that these are things that, including my wife and my children, by the way, right. not that I see them as property or possessions, yeah, but I see them as a gift, as a blessing from God. And so, therefore, I want to be the steward mm -hmm. of those blessings instead of being the possessor. Because when we become and we become the possessor of the blessings, then it becomes mine, not God's. And so, therefore, I'm sitting here saying, how do I protect my wealth? How do I protect my home? How do I protect my children? And all of a sudden, it's all about me and what I can do instead of what God can do through me. And so what Jesus is saying, he says, I'm telling you, it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, there was rich people, Lazarus, who died and was raised again, was a very rich man. So it's not, you know, we've studied Genesis. Abraham was a very rich man. Um, Jacob, Isaac, all of them, you know, inherited dad's wealth. There's a lot of rich people. David. You know, David, David Solomon, well, shout out. But see, the point is, is God's not saying, yeah, hey, Give up everything, you know. I I truly believe that God gives us the, the ability to live in America as a blessing, so that we can use these blessings that God gives to us, so we can go and help others. But what happens is when we begin to hoard it and hold on to it, and say, "Well, this is mine," and oh, God, you're supposed just to get ten percent, or you know, hey, five percent, or I give you a little bit, or I might even give you a little bit of an offering above my ten. You know, and when we begin to dicker with that with God, then all of a sudden we're beginning to say, hey, this is all mine, but I'm kind of giving back to God what I think he needs. God don't need anything. You know, giving a tithe is an act of worship. Singing a hymn is an act of worship. Serving, like we, I went with a group of men, we helped build a, um, a wheelchair ramp. Because there was a bunch of other churches. This family called a bunch of other churches in their area and said, hey, we need a real a, 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 wheel, a wheelchair yeah, ramp. You saw the video from Terry. You know, other churches were putting it down. Now, we don't have the resources. We don't have the money. Oh, call Pursuit. She called Pursuit. Yeah, we'll do it. Bam. Got a group of guys together. Built a wonderful ramp. Beautiful ramp. You know, it was great. 
Those are things not to pat anybody on the back. It's, hey, this is what God's doing through us when we're using those resources. And so he says, he says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. When the disciples heard this, they were astonished and they go, well, wait a minute then. You know, who can be saved? Well, I don't understand this, God. And then Jesus turns around looking at them and says, with people, it is totally impossible. What was the rich Roman you were trying to do? What can I do? What, can, what thing must I do to inherit, can, the, um, inherit eternal life? You know? And he was being honest. He was being, he, he came to Jesus. Jesus didn't come to him. He came to Jesus. He was hedging his bet. Yeah. Well, and, 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 and he wasn't expecting Jesus to tell him to give up everything. He was kind of hoping that because in his, <laughs> mind, in his mindset, he probably realized that, hey, I got a lot of blessings and all. I'm blessed from God, so why would God tell me to give it up? But God, but what Jesus was pointing out to him and saying, hey, this is what's blood. holding you between having a true relationship with God or not is because you own this stuff so much, and it's not a blessing from God. It's ownership now. And so what happens is the disciples heard this, and they're astonished. They go, who can be saved? And Jesus says, with people, it's impossible. But with God, <coughs> nothing's impossible. <coughs> Get that point. It doesn't matter where a person comes from, whether they're wealthy, whether they're poor, whether they're, they're the guy on the street, or you know, Bill Gates. You know, we need to, you know, we need to be praying for people no matter what their status is. You know, James, if you want to read a powerful book, maybe and do we ever go through James? I can't remember if we did or not. But James is a, is a wonderful book, but it's a, it's one of these books. Huh? Yeah, it's one of these books that just kind of steps on your feet all along. Uh -huh. Because James constantly says, hey, look, if you see this rich man come in, you get, oh, hey, dog, move over. Let me give you this great seat. You know, but you come in and go, hey, Kenny, you know, I know where you come from. You'll shut the back row. You know, I got this. You're missing the point here. You're missing the whole point. But with God, nothing's impossible. So Peter says to him, behold, now, now again, you got, you got to stop and think, where's Peter at in all this? So Peter, I love Peter because he always puts his, mouth, his foot in his mouth before he thinks. Peter, behold, we left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Okay, well, hey, Jesus got to say, hey, look, you got to lose everything. He told the, the rich ruler, give it all up and come and follow me. Peter's going, well, I've done that. Gee whiz, yeah, all right. So, hey, God, we lost it all. We're, we gave everything up. You know, wisdom for me. And watch how Jesus does this. Because there's a hidden motive mm -hmm. behind Peter. Peter's still selfish. He's, he's still kind of, okay, yeah, look at me. I gave it all up. I gave it all up. Remember, I had to go catch that little fish just for us to get a coin to pay taxes. It's like that. Hey, I gave it all up. Jesus says this, truly I say to you, and he's being honest. Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, that you have followed me, and in the regeneration of the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, and you shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Everyone who has left their house, their brothers, their sisters, their father, their mother, their children, their farm, for my sake, will receive many times much more and will inherit eternal life. But, I love this, but many who are first will be last, and the last shall be first. Go ahead. All right, so, uh, my home Bible study, we've been going over Revelations, and I'm stupid when it comes to Revelations because I still don't understand a lot of the old school prophecies, and I'm having to try to go back and check. But one of the questions that came up, and this, I guess this confers kind of what we were believing at the end, was, did Judas get into heaven? Okay. Did you, are, you, are you asking me? Yeah, what do you, what do you think? Because according to what was just said, Jesus just said the 12 disciples would sit on the throne. Well, All right. It doesn't say the twelve disciples. It says the twelve tribes. Read it again. He, well, he says, "Everyone who left his brother, his house, his brother, his father and mother for my sake will inherit many times." He said, "Okay." He says, um, "I'm sorry." Verse twenty-eight. And I said, "Truly, I say to you, that you have followed me, okay, in the regeneration of the Son of Man, who will sit on His glorious throne, and you shall sit upon twelve thrones." So he's talking to the disciples, the twelve of them. To and judge. He, and, and he says, and you'll be judging the 12 tribes. Now, you got to understand, he is talking to Judas. Yeah. Okay? Ju 
Jesus never treated Judas wrong, even though he knew Judas was going to betray him. Because it's okay? a vital part of the entire of the. Now plan. your question is: Is Judas in heaven? I will tell you this. Or do you think he? Do you think he made it to heaven? Was kind of the whole thing. My personal thought is no. But, I, but I'm going to tell you this: God is the one who judges the yeah. hearts. And and when you and we'll get to this later on when we come to that chapter, but Judas ends up regretting that he um, sold off um, Jesus. Now he continues to call him rabbi. So even when 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 he, when he meets Jesus and betrays him, he calls him rabbi, teacher. Okay, he doesn't call him Lord. Peter, when Jesus says, "Who do you say I am?" Peter comes out and says, "You are the Messiah." Other disciples have said, yes, you are the Messiah. You know, Judas never, from what we see in Scripture, Judas never accepted Jesus as the Messiah. He accepted him as a teacher. Now, regret for doing something wrong is not repentance, okay? It doesn't get you into heaven. Just because you regret that you, you did a sin, if you still never ask Jesus and God to, to forgive you those sins, those sins are still going to stand, stand against you, okay? And I also, if... if Jesus had repented and asked God for forgiveness, he wouldn't have committed suicide. Yeah. He also, it's my thoughts. Yeah. Jesus, so, I mean, personally, I don't think Judas is in that. Now, the 12 thrones, you know, now we get now we get to an interesting point. So what happens, and does this stop? Because okay, this is going to be a rabbit.